lined up and research so it's just a matter of me editing the videos so let me just do a little disclaimer before we start um and just so you know like i'm not used to this so i have a bunch of notes right underneath the camera that i'm looking at so if my eyes are shifting a lot that's why so let's just get right into it the following program is a crime-based series which may have some graphic details that some viewers and listeners may find disturbing or triggering if this is not something of your interest, or you are impressionable, or easily affected by crime stories, I suggest possibly skipping this video. If you do decide to continue watching, feel free to exit out at any moment if things get too tense, and click on a light-hearted video. All information has been gathered from public sources and has been compiled all into one video for whoever may be interested in researching, reviewing cases, or educational purposes. Well, let me first off and just say hi, my name is Dee Dee, and welcome to my new series. Damn, Canada! We got some crazy shit. We got some crazy stuff that goes on here in Canada, and I feel like a lot of the world doesn't really know how crazy things can get here. Canada has a very different justice system, where we focus more on we focus more on rehabilitation instead of incarceration. So life in prison here is 25 years. After that, your case gets reviewed, I believe every two years, and you can be let out. So you do get life in prison here, but you could be free after your life in prison. But I'm truly passionate about Canadian crime and what goes on here in Canada. So that's what I'll be focusing on. So I'm gonna stop laughing and get into today's case. I just wanna say beforehand, please keep in mind when writing comments that uh, friends and family may be seeing your comments. You don't, you never know. So please just be very respectful in that nature. Uh, I have no problem deleting comments if I see them pop up that are very rude or I feel like the family would be upset about that. So I, I will delete it <laughs> and I'll block you. I have no problem with that either. Anyways. Let's um, dive in. Today I'm going to be talking about the Minto double murder. I'm going to give a specific warning on this. This case does involve decapitation. So um, if that is very triggering to you, or if that makes you very squeamish, eh, maybe you want to get out of this video. See you next time. Um, for everyone else, let's jump right in. So, Veronica Deckery, also known as Verna, and Fred Fulton were common law partners who had a modest little home on the outskirts of the village of Minto, which is a small village about 50 kilometers east of Fredericton, New Brunswick. Um, in Canada, you and your significant other are considered common law once you've lived in a conjugal relationship for over one year. In case you didn't know, Verna was originally born in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and later moved into Minto. She had three sons and one daughter. Fred was born in Minto and had previously been married to Mildred McKeel, with whom he had one son and one daughter, but unfortunately she passed in 1991. Side note, when I do my cases, I really want to be focusing more on the victims and... I give as much backstory as I can on them because this is really about them. I don't want everything to be glorified about the killers and everything like that. So um, I will always be trying to give as much information as victims as I can, just so you guys know. But unfortunately, sometimes there isn't a lot of information, so just kind of keep that in mind. Back in. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to find too much information about them but I was actually able to find this a beautifully written piece about Fred Fulton on mentocountrymusic.ca website and he was a 2001 inductee to the Minto Country Music Hall of Fame which read one of Minto's most popular guitar players was born on August 4th 1930 at an early age, Fred began playing tunes and imitating the runs of his long, or his lifelong idol, Chet Atkins. Before many years passed, Fred's talents started to become very well known. He was very eager to play, and soon the Casaloma Rhythmeries were formed. 
Jimmy Chapman on the fiddle, Alden Barton on bass, rhythm and vocals, Bob Clark and Marg, Marg, Marg or Marg, I hope I'm saying that right, Fusquel on vocal and backup, Leonce Andres on accordion, and of course Fred on lead guitar. Uh, this group was renowned at the local dance hall and played the regular Saturday dance for over 30 years. Soon the band moved into a regular radio spot on Fredericton CFNB. Fred had been playing guitar for 57 years and during that time he has always been ready to help out in any community event. Telethons, benefits, country shows, thousands of jam sessions. Many young musicians have imitated his fluid style over the years that wish to emulate the Chet Atkins run that Fred was so famous for. He has always had time to teach any young musician who is willing to learn. He literally just sounds like the sweetest guy ever. Anyway, um, Fred and Ferna had a neighbor named Gregory Allen Depre. Gregory was born in Mento, New Brunswick in July 1982. His parents, Jenny and Glenn, separated when he was just a kid and he later moved in with his mom in Massachusetts. He easily made friends and was involved in community activities and as a teenager he joined some sport teams and was in the cadets. He also worked some part-time jobs as well. But by the age of 16, Gregory's mother started noticing changes in his personality. But she just kind of chalked it up to teenage rebellion. Um, most parents probably would at that age. Once he was 17, he actually moved back to Minto. Gregory was known to have lived a nomadic lifestyle, basically, meaning he moved around his entire life. He actually severed ties with his mother for almost two years until she actually moved back to Minto herself. By the time his mo mother moved back though, Gregory had begun isolating himself by locking himself away for long periods of time. His mother was obviously concerned as any mother would be and asked if he was doing drugs. He did obviously deny this, but we do find out later on that this was a lie. And from that point on, Gregory's mental state just completely deteriorated. Statements later on from Gregory's mother, Jenny Depre, explained how things changed with him and noting he became withdrawn, aggressive, and very paranoid. He attempted to join the army multiple times, but he failed. But ended up making an illusion in his head but that he was training for the military. Gregory's grandfather, um, actually I'll later testified that Gregory would talk to himself for hours in his bedroom and then sometimes he would be in the bathroom for hours on end yelling at himself in the mirror and when his grandfather would ask him what he was doing he would say that he was training for the military and that's what they did to train they would yell at themselves in the mirror so Obviously, these are just all kind of uh, red flags. They're all just kind of watching Gregory at this point. Gregory was living with his grandfather at the time, um, Adolf, Adolf, on Main Street in Minto. And Adolf's wife also owned the property next to Fred and Verna, where they kept a travel trailer. Gregory actually spent a lot of time there, especially on the weekends. Adolf drove Gregory down to his property Saturday, April 23rd, 2005, about 6.30. He only stayed for about 10 minutes and then left, believing his grandson Gregory was going to a party with some friends later that night. Adolf had arranged to take Gregory to Oromocto on Monday morning, but that did not occur because when Jenny went to go pick up Gregory from the trailer on Monday, Gregory was nowhere to be found. So in 2004, Gregory had actually gotten into a fight with Fred's grandson, Fred Moet, um, where Gregory actually pulled a knife on him, which originated from a dispute between them for over the noise complaint coming from Gregory's trailer. So this actually ended up in criminal charges being laid against Gregory for uttering threats and threatening with a weapon. And he, he was pending sentencing at this time. And he was actually supposed to be sentenced on April 25th, the Monday, which is actually probably why Jenny was going to pick him up. Anyways, 
It was said Fred Fulton was so fearful of Gregory, he had taken sleeping pills just to sleep at night, which couldn't have, it just must have been awful for him. Um, then on April 24th, 2005, Gregory left his trailer, walked a short distance across the property line to Fred and Verna's house. He then cut the open screen and followed by kicking the second door in. Gregory then was able to gain access to the house and went straight to the bedroom where he began stabbing Verna to death. Fred attempted to flee, but from the bloody footprints followed by bloody boot prints, it was clear Fred put up a very big fight. The footprints trailed around the house to the bathroom where it's assumed that he had barricaded himself from Gregory for a little while, also where an altercation took place. There was even prints leading all the way to the porch, leading investigators to believe that Fred had actually gotten as far as the port before Gregory ultimately overpowered him. Fred was 74 at the time and Gregory was just 22, um, which also makes this an unfair advantage. It's then assumed from blood marks and forensic analysis that Gregory dragged him back into the house, stabbed him, and then finished off by decapitating him with a chainsaw. Um, from there, Gregory packed up Fred and Verna's car with the murder weapons and made his way towards the Cow's Main border crossing. Um, once at the border, the guards found in Gregory's possession a homemade sword, a hatchet, pepper spray, brass knuckles, a chainsaw, which was stained with Fred's blood. He told the guards he was an assassin from the United States for the United States president, um, George Bush at the time, if that matters. Um, and he has assassinated over 700 people. The red flags, uh, but the guards just fingerprinted him, took all his weapons away and let him go because he was a US citizen and they had no reason to detain him. Even though he was supposed to be back on the 25th that day for his sentencing. They actually asked him if he wanted to call and he told them, no, I'm not going back there with a smile. And then off he went. Now back in Minto, Fred's daughter, Debbie, was getting worried of Fred and Verna. They were a very close family and Debbie even cleaned their house twice a week and also regularly visited in between those days, which just tells how close of a family they were. They told each other everything, where they were going, what they were doing, all of that. They had not been answering their phone calls since she had been over on the Friday, April 22nd. Uh, she was over for dinner, they were playing card, and they were just hanging out. Um, she tried to call them on Sunday afternoon, but also got no answer. She then tried to call, and again on Monday, she still got no answer. By Tuesday, April 26th, she still had not been able to contact Fred or Verna, so she decided to go over there, which actually, their house was only a five minute drive away from hers. When Debbie arrived at her father, Verna's house, she noticed that her father's car was not in the driveway like usual. Um, and last time she spoke, they never mentioned about going anywhere. She walked up the back steps to the screened in porch, which was the usual entrance to the place and noticed what seemed to be some blood spots on the porch. And as she entered, she saw blood on the floor and some stuff thrown um, around the room. And then she noticed there was blood on the door leading into the kitchen, which was also actually slightly opened. Um, when she pushed the door open, she then found her father's decapitated body lying on the floor in front of the washer and dryer, partially covered by a blanket, which she didn't even recognize. She then ran to go find Verna, but got so scared that she ran back outside and was just screaming and besides herself. A neighbor that lived across the street um, named Paul LeBlanc had heard Debbie screaming and ran to his window where he saw Debbie and he immediately called 911. He had ran over to Debbie, I believe during the phone call as well, and when he reached her, she was still screaming, and she was screaming, they took my father's head, which can only be the most traumatic thing you can hear. The dispatched officer to the scene was advised ahead of time that this was involving a murder and there was a possible decapitation. Um, so when Constable Philip Brannon arrived, 
Debbie was besides herself. She pointed, to, she was pointing to the house and she was continuously screaming. They took my father's head. Constable Brannon then walked towards the same door Debbie had and came upon the same scene, noting all the same things that Ble Debbie had noticed as well. He briefly looked around um, for Fred's head, but then decided to, he better go off outside and protect the scene. Um, the head was later found under uh, the kitchen table in a pillowcase. Although for some reason the media reported that Fred's head was found out, kicked out the back door. Um, that was not true at all. That's very twisted. When Constable Brandon was outside, he that's when he learned that um, Vern also lived there. So another officer, Constable Swin Campbell, um, had arrived and they decided to go into the house and look for Verna. They found her body in a pool of blood on the floor in the master bedroom. They also found a military style dagger lying on the living room floor. Once back outside, the officers quickly learned Fred's car was missing and that Fred and Verna's neighbor, Gregory Allen Depre, was their number one suspect. Everybody right from the right from when the cops got there were saying that it was him. Everyone they asked, um, just all signs pointed to Gregory. So now the question to the cops were, where's Gregory? Gregory had driven Fred's car to a gravel pit off Route 3 um, near Brockway in Charlotte County. A witness later came forward noting that she was driving by um, and noticed someone at that car at the time and it looked like somebody was wrapping something. She wasn't able to confirm if it was a male or a female. He then hitchhiked all the way to the border with many people coming forward after hearing of the murders and saying that they actually seen this hitchhiker or the suspect that they were look the cops were looking for walking down various roads to the border. Um, one of the witnesses actually said that Gregory told them that he was waiting because somebody was giving him a job to work in the woods, which would, I guess, give a good explanation for the chainsaw and the tomahawk. Anyway, once at the border, the, the guards found in Gregory's possession everything that I said before. Yeah, they let him go. So from the border, he actually hitchhiked all the way south to Massachusetts, where he, on April 27th, he was found by a um, Mata Poiset, I hope I'm saying that right, a police officer, wandering aimlessly around on the side of the road. When the police officer picked him up and did a routine check, he found out that Gregory had the warrant out for his arrest for missing his court date on the Monday, and he was also a suspect in a double murder. Obviously, the evidence was staggering against Gregory. The autopsy showed Verna had 30 injuries, four that were significant. She had been stabbed in the face, neck, chest, and had a punctured lung. Her cause of death was massive blood loss. Fred's autopsy showed that in addition to being decapitated, Fred had 31 injuries, most of which were classified as sharp force injuries inflicted by a sharp metal instrument. Two other significant injuries were in the chest area and he also had punctured lungs. He had a number of defensive injuries as well. His death was caused by multiple forced injuries and um, decapitation. They had Staff Sergeant Richard, who is a certified blood stain pattern an analyst, study the patterns in the house for three days and was able to match up the blood patterns to Fred and Verna's injuries from drag marks across the floor to press marks against the walls, resulting in being able to paint a clear picture of what exactly happened in this house on that dreadful day. And remember those boot prints throughout the house? Um, they also had Donald Hulsman, who was certified as a footwear examiner and declared expert on footwear identification and comparison on the scene. He testified that the boot, boot prints matched up with Gregory's by accidental characteristics and classic characteristics. Meaning, accidental characteristics are the scuffs, the rocks in the boot patterns, just the wear and tear um, that Gregory specifically makes to his shoes. All the classic um, 
shoe characteristics would be like the make and model size look. Um, so he was actually able to use Gregory's exact boots that he was wearing the day of the murders uh, because when he was taken into custody in Massachusetts, um, they had seized his boots. Um, they had also seized um, Gregory's sweatshirt, a pair of boots, two hairs that were reportedly from the left boot, and a pair of gloves and a black jacket. They also had known blood stains from, from Ferna and from Red. So you would think that this case would be an easy, open, closed um, case, but unfortunately, the defense actually raised the issue of whether or not Gregory was criminally responsible for these crimes due to the fact of his mental state. The defense pulled out all the works on proving Gregory was suffering from a mental illness and was not criminally responsible for this. Um, I think it's okay to say, even though the evidence against Gregory doing this crime was basically black and white, the evidence against him having an, a mental disorder was very prevalent uh, beforehand. During the first trial, which was scheduled April, September 5th, 2006, Gregory fired his lawyer because of a disagreement, which ended up pushing the trial back to January 8th, 2007. It was during this trial that Gregory lashed out at his lawyer and accused him of working for Al-Qaeda in Saddam Hussein, then demanded he be fired by the judge for refusing he, his request. Gregory's lawyer requested Gregory be sent for a psych eval, which the judge agreed and the trial ended. So I just want to step back for a minute and say that this happened in 2005. It's now January 2007. This family has been through something horrific. And even though Gregory does have a mental disorder, this case has now been going on for two years. So once the evaluations were done, one of the psychologists actually said that he was unfit to stand trial and um, that they believed he had paranoid schizophrenia. And they were able to back up what the doctor said from his mother from statements from his mother and grandfather from what they had witnessed over the years um on july 11 2007 gregory was brought before the provincial mental health review board which found that he he had responded well to treatment and was now fit to stand trial the second trial began november 5th 2007 and all the evidence from the first trial was was admitted in court thankfully now, even though Gregory had this mental disorder, which the defense was able to prove, they also now had to prove that Gregory was actually in an episode during uh, the time of the murders. Even though Gregory met with two psychologists, he would not speak of the murders, and therefore there was no direct evidence from him explaining why he did this, what his mental state even was at the time. Um, because the first official document of him were at the border and he was noted to have said that he was a marine sniper just coming back from a job and he was an assassin and he killed over 700 people that kind of clarified that he was not thinking clearly um, but the border guard actually did testify that he appeared to be wired but did speak normally and seemed just to be and seemed to be very aware of everything going on, which is actually very common with people with paranoid schizophrenia. Um, they could be having an absolutely crazy, insane um, thoughts and be talking about just absolutely out there things, but they're saying it with such confidence and they're in the room with you and they're, they're here, which I feel like a lot of people make don't really associate it with the schizophrenia, which falls into the line of the whole mental stigma and all that. My cat wants in the room. So unfortunately, this, this type of case is just so hard because they wanna get justice for the loved ones and the victims, 
Um, but when mental health becomes a factor in these cases, especially such a serious mental disorder, such as Gregory's, it's hard to fully give the family just that. And please don't take this as a justification for the murders because that is not what this is. So on March 5th, 2008, Justice William Grant found Gregory Allen Dupre guilty of the deaths of Fred Fulton and Veronica Decury in April 2005. However, not criminally responsible for his actions at the time. So since this is Canada, we are very keen on rehabilitation over incarceration. And now Gregory is currently being held at Shepherdy Healing Center, which is a part of Dorchester Penitentiary. Due to the fact he was not criminally responsible because of his mental illness, he has his case reviewed every two years by the New Brunswick Mental Health Review Board. So now more recently, in March 2019, Gregory actually requested to be transferred to closest high security psychiatric facility where English was spoken and I probably I'm assuming that's because Quebec was in the middle of uh, Ontario New Brunswick so um, that ended up being the Waypoint Health Center for Mental Health in Pent bear with me Pentaguishin Ontario Penetanguishin. Um, Gregory, Gregory actually had absolutely no ties to Ontario and has never been actively involved in any sort of treatment and he has still never talked about that night or what he did. So because of that he was actually denied and is still at his original facility. The family strongly rejected this transfer due to the fact that he had never started treatment and he's never agreed to what he did. He's never actively been involved in any treatment. So why should he have the right to hold up everybody and ask to be transferred when he's not even involved in active treatment or very or even trying to address the issues? Which actually Mary Kennedy Fulton, a relative of Fred Fulton, had actually said in an interview. She actually stated, it's like opening up a wound that never gets closed and it's always like that with these hearings. But now it's net magnified by Mr. Dupre's wishes again. Which you can see there was a pattern of things just being extended and extended because of the actions of Gregory. Family of Fred and Vernon have also been very active in um, going to all of the review board hearings and reading their victim impact statements. So if this move were to take place, um, they would actually have to travel all the way to Ontario every two years just to read their victim impact statements, which is just not fair to them to make them spend that much money on just traveling alone and everything. But uh, fortunately, the board recommended the transfer to take place, but the decision was later rejected by the Attorney General. The next review board hearing is scheduled for March 2021. So that's the end of my very first true crime video. I hope that you guys were able to follow along. I hope everything made sense. Um, this case is a kind of awkward one where I kind of had to go back and forth, so I hope the layout of everything just made sense in general. Um, and I'm actually going to leave links to the documents that I got all this information from was from court documents. If you have any recommendations or criticisms, leave them below. Let me know. Um, anything I can do to make my videos better, I would love to do. Um, so yeah, I hope everyone stays safe out there and I hope you enjoyed my video. Have a good one. Bye.